You're listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled, Why Drones Have a Bright Future in Oil and Gas. Drones, or autonomous equipment, should encounter a very receptive market in the oil and gas sector. Of all the digital technologies, drones will deliver superior, triple bottom line benefits. Moreover, it is in many oil and gas basins' best interest to accelerate autonomy solutions, and here's why. Let's begin with, what exactly is autonomous kit? Well, think of any piece of equipment that typically must have a human operator at the helm. Heavy haulers, delivery vehicles, cars, forklifts, airplanes, helicopters, rail locomotives, submersibles, yellow goods, rigs, cranes, ships. The list is almost endless. Digital advances are making it possible to dispense with the the in-the-cabin operator or driver of these mechanical contraptions, or at the least, dispense with having one in the driver's seat that is an integral part of the kit. These advances include complex mathematics, learning systems, sensors, data networks, cameras, robotics, and digital controllers that have fallen in price and expanded in capability to bring autonomous control to within grasp of most manufacturers. Autonomous kit should win, where work to be done is some potent combination of extra dangerous, and so elaborate protections are needed to safeguard the humans, or high volume routine, what can be more routine than driving, or extra costly, perhaps by virtue of its location, such as in far off northern oil mines, or by virtue of the scarcity of the skills needed, as with pilots. There's a handful of public examples of trials underway for autonomous kit in public spaces, Google Cars, for example, and Uber's taxis and Tesla's driver assist. But there's untold instances of real working and delivered autonomous equipment in use around the world. The oil industry has been slow to innovate directly in autonomous, and the adoption curve shows the usual slow pace. But it's coming. Autonomous kit will take longer to make a difference in those situations where risks are considered low, such as painting, the work is not that routine, say, nursing, and cost isn't really a driver, such as cleaning. Of course, I'm probably wrong. What's truly baffling for me is why oil and gas kit still has a human in the middle of their contraptions, despite the fact that humans are inherently unreliable and risky things. Surely one of the challenges facing the industry is the amount of training required to maintain and operate complex equipment in the face of a huge outflow of experienced employees. Some 50% of oil and gas workers will retire in the next five years alone. What's even more puzzling is why engineers insist on baking a human role into the middle of their kit without consulting the true end user or operator. Great design means reducing the cognitive load to use the equipment. So why is oil and gas particularly well suited to exploring and using an autonomous kit? Well, there's lots of good reasons. The work can be dangerous. Fumes and vapors from the product can asphyxiate or ignite. The work location is frequently remote and harsh, driving up the cost of housing human operators. Well-trained human capital is now scarce because of the downsizing in the sector. The sector is an avid consumer of the kinds of kit that autonomous favors, such as heavy lifters, haulers, and movers. The physical assets, that's the plants and the pipelines, are long-life assets that require steady and often routine attention, making payback easier. The work has lots of routine elements. Heavy haulers trundling around mines or engineers driving around to inspect the facilities. And the environments where autonomous kit can be deployed are not shared with public use infrastructure, such as the public highway system. This obviously takes away some of the risks. Some oil and gas basins have other intrinsic features that make them conducive to autonomous kit. These include a vigorous and technically capable supply chain, such as what you find in Canada and the United States, widespread network coverage, again over most of North America, generally high-cost labor, as you find in Canada and Australia, Demanding safety regulations, again, Canada and Australia, a large installed base of infrastructure, Canada, U.S. and Australia, and finally, a low technology transfer costs. Curiously, the land down under, Australia, has an unusually impressive record in innovating in the area of autonomous equipment, mostly in mining, but there's at least one good example from the gas sector. Let's begin with mining haulers. The big iron ore mines in far off Western Australia are considered world leaders in developing the autonomous mine truck. These heavy haulers work in a well-defined and controlled space, an open-cut mine, where there's no one about but other miners. The cost of a heavy hauler driver is magnificent. The crews work around the clock from fly-in, fly-out camps and travel from all over Australia. The mines pay for the travel, pay for the camps, and pay extra costs for the social costs. 
it's not hard to grasp the significance of moving away from human drivers on heavy haulers. Imagine having effectively a single computer driver who is constantly learning from the experience of driving all the haulers. That experience is captured and shared across all the haulers in real time, making the system constantly smarter and safer. Imagine a central control room where the operators are based that isn't on the mine site, but is in a large city where the operators want to live, improving turnover and reducing absenteeism. Fewer drivers are needed and can supervise multiple trucks at the same time. Imagine the positive impact on recruiting, training, and supervision. And imagine a shift change with no reduction in productivity because the trucks don't actually stop trucking. The driver simply stands up and her replacement takes over. And yes, there's lots of women in mine site hauling because they're far safer drivers than men. And imagine a far more uniform usage profile of the mining trucks because an autonomous fleet would always operate precisely the same way, yielding precisely uniform brake usage, for instance. Imagine the ability to model out exact routing, which would translate into more precise field performance and more accurate business performance. Well, I'm not at all surprised to see news stories about autonomous haulers getting a serious look in the Canadian oil sands. Next, let's consider aerial drones. The new gas fields in Queensland are using drones, also called unmanned aerial vehicles, to fly inspection runs over the gas field assets, mostly the um, gas wells in the coal seam gas arena. The wells are relatively low productivity, heavily regulated, remote, and numerous. The old model was to assign a field operator to a handful of wells that would be visited on some scheduled basis. The ratio of operator to well was low because of the extensive drive times to get to the wells, and well operators might be on some kind of shift, maybe even the same kind as an offshore oil worker, two weeks on, two weeks off, driving these enormous distances creating a serious safety risk, and might visit wells that needed absolutely no attention at all, leading to wasted effort. Initial drone trials led to the realization that aerial technology could do the job, but only with industrial-grade gear from serious players. The drones needed to fly at night, so as not to disturb pastoral lands and the grazers. They needed to fly quite high, several hundred meters up, well out of sight, and therefore needed a strong power plant and high-end aeronautic controls. The drones also need to carry a big payload, high-resolution digital cameras, emission sensors, LIDAR, moisture sensors, and so on. They take before and after photos to see how much vegetation has grown, if the well has been flooded, and if it's been damaged by frisky kangaroos. They needed to plug into work systems that created the next day's work roster, including what wells needed to be visited and why, what parts to load on the operator's truck, and even the order to visit the wells based on landowner access permits. The payoff has been very significant. A single drone can fly over and inspect more than 100 wells each night, whereas an operator might visit just six or seven per day. Demanning the gas field delivers all the same HR benefits as autonomous haulers, with better safety outcomes because there's much less driving. Of course, pilots aren't cheap either, but there's far fewer needed, and because of their training and flight operations, they're inherently safety conscious. These UAVs could have a big impact on the huge and widespread oil and gas infrastructure that is typical in the Canadian and U.S. oil and gas fields, such as the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin and the newer unconventional fields of the Horn River and the Montney. And yes, UAVs could help make a step change in cost, productivity, and safety performance in oil and gas. There's lots of other great examples that oil and gas could embrace. There's a completely human-free container port facility that operates fully lights out. The trucks and cranes and all the vehicles on the site are loading and unloading containers around the clock without any human intervention. And how about the autonomous drill rig that can cut, uh, cut human operator headcount from dozens to just a handful? And how about the robot trials for carrying out tank inspections and welding jobs during turnarounds? And how about the uh, UAVs that do flare stack inspections, a particularly hazardous and nasty job? Well, what's next? Autonomous Kit is stepping onto Moore's Law and will fall in cost while improving in capability every 18 months or so. If you're a supply company, you need to be asking what autonomy will do to your current product and service offering. And if you're an operator, you need to be asking what autonomy will do to your cost and productivity profile. Either way, your organization needs to be asking about what autonomy will do to you. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.